Um, yesterday, holy wow, it was amazing. I mean, it was truly amazing. Um, for those of you guys who were unaware, um, we it was kind of a last minute thing, but the Lancaster Food Pantry and us, we got together and, and made some decisions, some connections. My wife is just incredible. Um, contacted them. Um, we got cones still out there from the Lancaster PD. They were here just kind of setting up cones and everything, but we gave away food for 100 families. And so um, that's... That's what the, the, coolers, the coolers that Kelly was talking about, those are what um, was going toward, they, they were, we were storing eggs in those, and, um, but we had uh, boxes, we had meat, we had eggs, I mean, it was just amazing. People responded, uh, the Boy Scout troop was here helping out, um, people with, within our church were here helping out. All week long, people were participating by, by putting boxes together and just – I'll have some pictures for you guys next week. I, I didn't get a chance to get them all together. If you're on social media, you can see them on Facebook um, or Instagram or whatever. But, but there was just this incredible presence, this incredible presence as a church. And it was so inspiring that the police chief – all right, the police chief approached my wife and said – we need to do this again, and I want to give you some opportunity. I want to actually contact some people so that you have more resources available and have more things available to make this an even better event. And so, um, I mean, it was just like there were vehicles pulling in, and, and um, you know, we were just like putting boxes of food for families and just the look on their faces, the delight. Um, unfortunately, they didn't get to see our smiles because, um, the, you know, the, the masks were on and everything like that. And, and, uh, but, but anyway, it was just an incredible, incredible thing. And um, she's not in here right now, but my wife is just awesome. I mean, her orchestrating all of these different details, getting in contact with the food bank, getting in contact with the police department, just putting all of these pieces together that we were able to actually have a mobile food pantry here that we were able to have a hundred boxes of food that people came in, we gave them food and the food that did not go out in the vehicles that were coming through, we actually were able to put them into vehicles and deliver them to people who had need. Now that right there is an awesome church. Um, you know, we, we, we found ourselves at a bit of a challenge within the, the, the parameters of this coronavirus. Does it sound good, Kelly? Okay, awesome. Um, she was checking on something for me. Anyway, um, in, in, the, in the midst of all of these things that are going on in our country, there has been a shutdown, if you will. I mean, just an immediate attention. Our church had never done live streaming before. When everything shut down, we had suddenly had to adapt. Before, we had terrible internet, and then we were able to get better internet. Our streaming is getting better. Things are getting better. It has just been incredible to see God move and God do amazing things to make it possible for us to stream. And then slowly um, creating opportunity for us to be in church again. Slowly creating opportunity for us to gather again. Thank you guys for being respectful and practicing that social distancing piece. Um, make sure that you guys are aware, uh, you know, just as things are going on after service, you know, put your masks on, head out so that we're just being respectful and polite and all that stuff. Just throwing that in there. Anyway, um, we have had some some challenges, and I've watched, I've watched as this church has said, you know what, we're going to jump in both feet, and we're going to watch God move. We're going to adapt. We are going to show just how versatile we are. We're going to change the game, and we're going to bring the message to people even though the building is closed. We're going to put on our masks. We're going to ding-dong ditch, as some of us did. This mobile food pantry that we had here where we delivered 100 boxes to people that were driving in, we had actually, many, many weeks before, we had been bringing people from the church and families. They were getting boxes in their vehicles. They were going to people's homes. They were knocking on them, their doors and running <laughs> so that there wasn't any uh, social engagement and, and giving people groceries that way. I mean, we are developing 
as a church, we are watching as this church adapts, and it has been beautiful. It has been beautiful. You guys are so amazing, and I am so thankful and appreciative that I get to call this my church. This is my church. This is your church. And you should be delighted that you have had the privilege to respond to the gospel and, and, and do it, to, to, to be Jesus Christ so that people can meet Jesus Christ. You know, as I've said many times before, one of the most difficult questions oftentimes to ask ourselves as we engage in ministry in a community, if this church ceased to exist, would people miss it? Would they know that it was gone? I believe they would. I believe they would. Ugh. Starting a brand new series this morning titled Love Does. Love Does. And, and uh, it has been, it has been uh, difficult and challenging. It has been hard. We have um, been involved in new forms of doing church. We've been involved in new forms of doing church. But in this, in this new adaptive way, we are discovering more and more what love really is. What love really is. And I wrestled with this all week. Like, okay, you know, it kind of brought uh, Sunday's message to a close. And, um, and then, um, you know, last Sunday's message to a close. And then I was like, oh, what, what should I do now? You know, like, what should I do now? And I was just wrestling all week. I'm like, what's going on? What does God want me to do? How does God want me to accomplish this? What's God, you know, what's God's plan, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, just yesterday, finally, um, God was like, Seth, you need to preach about love. You need to preach about love. Seth, you need to, you need to talk to people about love. And I was like, okay. And so, like, like um, you know, I, I uh, man, something's going on. What is everybody looking at? Last week, my wife was killing a hornet, and now there's a deer. Look at you all. Oh, he's gone. See, y'all scared him away. Anyway, man, they're all, you guys that are online right now, they're all looking to the side here. I'm like, what's happening? Something big is going on. Okay. Anyway, um, so, wow, this is fun. Okay. So, um, so yesterday, as we were doing this incredible event, we watched as love and the love of Christ manifested itself. It manifested. He manifested himself through our actions and our behaviors. And so one of, if not the most difficult challenges of following God is to love like Jesus. Would you agree with me? Like one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult challenges, one of the most difficult challenges that, that, that we are given by God in following Christ is to love like Jesus. But I tell you what, if it was not possible, he would not have asked us to. You, you see what I'm saying? Like if, if it was not possible for us to love like God, if it was not possible for us to love like Jesus, he would not have asked us to. In Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, in the message it says, wake up from your sleep. Watch what God does and then do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. What? I mean, there's words like extravagant. There's words like not being cautioned. Words like he didn't want, you know, it wasn't something, he, he didn't, um, it wasn't something from us, but giving everything of himself. I mean, all these different words and phrases we hear, and then he says, love like that. Love like that. And that's, that's what we're doing over the next four weeks or five weeks. 
to love like that. This sermon series is going to challenge us. We're going to learn to love like that. In the message translation in John 3, 13, uh, or 13, 34 through 35, it says this. Let me give you a new command. Love one another in the same way I loved you. You love one another. This is how everything you or everything, uh, everyone will recognize that you are my disciples when you see the love you have for each other. Today I want to talk to you about awareness. I want to talk to you about being more mindful of the things that are going on around you. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for the truth. I pray right now, Father, that every detail of this message that you want me to speak would be spoken. If there is anything that you want silenced, Lord, that I would not see it on the page because I want to be a vessel. I want to be a conduit. I want to be your voice. I want to be your mouthpiece. So I pray right now, Father, that as I speak, it would be your words, that people would be impacted, lives would be changed. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. So, today in the realm of love does, I want to speak to you about our awareness. We need to become more aware and less detached. All right, so, many are detached. Many people are detached. We are detached in, in, in you know, <laughs> detachment means to disengage something or part of something and remove it or to disconnect, to separate, to leave oneself from a group or place. We are in difficult times and we do not want to participate in what's going on in the world around us. We want to exit reality. So we find our ways out of reality. We refuse to see things as they are. We don't see people where they are. We don't notice who we are. We don't want to be engaged. So we detach ourselves from reality. We detach ourselves from what's going on inside of us. If I were to say it differently, we are not as attuned to our environment as we think we are. We are not as attuned to our environment as we think we are, as we think we are. Now, there's a, there's a um, thing called perceptual blindness. I'm going to put a picture up here. Actually, Annette's going to put a picture up here on the, on the um, projector here. Now, that is a picture. This is, this is a concept called perceptual blindness. Now, you're going to see one of, one of two things, okay? You're either going to see an older lady or a younger lady, okay? Do you, do you see it? Does, any, does anybody see it? Okay, Grace, what did you see? You saw the younger one, okay? <laughs> Kelly, what did you see? <laughs> okay. I was going to ask somebody else, but I was kind of scared. So I'm still kind of scared. So anyway, um, right? But like perceptual blindness. Now, some of us, we saw both of them, probably because in some ways, I try to find a different picture because this is something some of us have seen before. But there is this perceptual blindness. There is this view of things that is based on what's going on in our mind. Robertson Davies said it this way. The eye sees only what the mind is prepared to comprehend. The eye sees... Only what the mind is prepared to comprehend. And some of us, some of the world, some of us in this room have chosen willful ignorance. That is a harsh way of saying it. But we have decided that we are not going to be engaged. We have decided that we are going to put ourselves in a position where we are oblivious to our surroundings. We are oblivious to the needs around us. These, these are hard words for just a moment, guys. Now, I saw, I witnessed yesterday, and I've witnessed in the weeks prior to that, as we, the church, have moved and begin to function as the church should, that there has not been a willful ignorance, but there has been a decision to open our eyes to the things around us and to respond appropriately. A person who is mindful is not detached or oblivious. They see what is not readily perceptive. A mindful person is watchful. They have their eye out for what others are missing. Mindfulness attends to details, little nonverbal behaviors that often speak more loudly than words. I am right now working in a field at Easter Seals where we have to attune ourselves to nonverbal communication. 
We've got to try to look at the child. We've got to try to see how the child is interacting. We've got to try to invest our time in looking in their eyes and looking at their mannerisms, their physical behavior, their distinctive facial uh, features and how those facial uh, features and things are changing and to begin to notice what's going on. Some of us, we, we, we don't even see. We don't even see what's happening. We don't even see what's happening. We were watching a, a, a television series a couple of days ago in my house, and, and, um, and, and my daughter, Liberty, she's like, does anybody notice that every time they sit down at this restaurant to talk, you know, there's kind of this place where all these characters in the show engage. Does anybody ever notice that they're not eating? I'm like, no, I never thought about it. You know, I, I never thought about that. You know, they're sitting down at this restaurant, and they're all talking and engaging, but nobody's eating. And then one thing that she pointed out like a few weeks ago, maybe it was more like a month ago, she's like, she's like, anybody else ever notice that all the extras that are walking by in the restaurant scene are all the same people? And I'm like, well, maybe they're all going out to eat, you know, at the restaurant because it's a familiar restaurant, you know? But like, like those are things that we become attuned to. Like that, that we just, we, we kind of block out or it blanks out because we're not aware of it. We're not thinking about it. It's not something that is in the forefront of our thoughts. But Liberty has a way of seeing things differently. She, she just, she sees the world differently. She sees, she interacts with things differently. She interacts with people differently. She has a perceptive view of the world that just blows my mind. Like all of us are just watching the show and she's like picking out all these different things that just seem so far out. Like, like and I mean, I could, I could pick out a lot of other things, but she just, she has this perceptive ability to see things that most people don't see. Most people are blind to. And so if we're going to be uh, people that do things out of love, we need to not be detached. You see, Jesus was mindful or Jesus was aware Jesus was aware. Jesus has always been about deconstructing systems and cultural norms that rob people of their humanity. We are the ones often asleep to that reality. I mean, Jesus just like, like um, you know, I, I remember um, being in a, in a place once where, where I was sitting in a place with a bunch of other people and they're like, oh, I'm just, you know, I don't like religion. You know, religion's not my thing. And I'm like, it wasn't Jesus either. I'm like, what? what are you talking about? You know, and so I was able to have a conversation to explain that in more detail. Like, this is not about what you think it's about. Jesus was all about deconstructing those systems. And so he finds himself in an environment where these Pharisees and Sadducees, every time I say Sadducees, I try to avoid the comic relief because they were sad, you see. Anyway, um, I just had to say it. Anyway. Um, so there's this environment where they're all talking and they're trying to pin him in a corner and make him confused and get him to uh, mess up what he's saying. And in Luke 10, 25 through 37, we see this dialogue happen where he uses a parable to explain the truth that he came to give. And so in verse 25, just starting right there, it says, One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking this question, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How, did you re how do you read it? Like, just flipping a script, like, okay, you're going to ask me a question, let me ask you a question. You know? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Boom, nailed it. And Jesus is like, right, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Now, I know that in our current culture, we could think of the person that's right next to us in our home, and that is in a lot of ways true, but, but he is speaking of this larger framework, this larger understanding of your neighborhood, if you will. And so he goes on to talk about the Good Samaritan. Now, this Good Samaritan story was a bit of a controversial thing because Samaritans weren't looked upon as very, you know, they, they, were, they were the outcasts of society. They weren't special. They weren't valued. In fact, they were there because there was this exile experience and they stayed in the land instead of leaving. And then they, you know, intermarried with the Jewish people and they had children. And it was just, it was this racial issue. 
The Jews looked at them with disrespect and disdain. They looked at them with disgust as they were, they, they were considered lower class. They were considered less than valuable. And Jesus is going to make a solid point about how the Samaritan is better than them. And that is like, whoa, like them fighting words, right? So here we go. Jesus replied with a story. The Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but he, when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. The temple assistant walked over um, and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised a despised Samaritan, the guy that you look down upon, just making a point, the guy that you disrespect, the guy that you think is lesser than, came along. And we saw the man. He felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If the, his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you. I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, the innkeeper must have respected this guy to trust him, okay? There had to have been some sort of respect that Jesus is trying to deliberately state in this parable. Not just, just creating another element of just how trustworthy the Samaritan was that they considered to be untrustworthy. Now, which of these three would you say was the neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yeah, now go and do the same. Now go and do the same. Many of Jesus' arguments took an ill-minded view. It took on the ill-minded view of religious leaders. They were naive. They refused to see things as they were. They were so focused on their own religious rules and laws and perspectives and decisions that they were completely oblivious to what was going on around them. I've talked about this before, but they even had rituals on how dishes were to be washed. Like if you look at the Bible, if you look at the text, if you look at what's going on, they had a rhythm. And this is, this is like lunacy. If they didn't do it right, they had to go back to the beginning and start washing the dishes over again. Whoa. No. No, 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 no. I don't even want to tell you about the practices of washing dishes that happened in my life when I was in college. Okay? If it looked clean, we were good. You've been there, all right? You've been there. <clears throat> anyway, um, so Jesus is shocking the system. He's opening their eyes to things. He's pointing out that their human character is flawed, and he's pointing out a truth by, in this narrative that expressed to them how fallen, broken, and misguided they were by using the narrative of, of, of an outcast of society. You see, Jesus saw what others didn't see. He saw what others didn't see. Jesus wanted others to see what they didn't see. Jesus wanted others to see what he saw. That's why he used parables. They were modern day stories, or modern day in that day, they were a modern day ex explanation of biblical truths, of, of spiritual truths that help people understand in a very, very uh, specific way. Jesus wanted them to see. In fact, the scripture has more than 40 references that say Jesus saw. Jesus saw. Jesus saw. You see, where others saw a paralyzed man, Jesus saw faith. Where others saw a political traitor, Zacchaeus, Jesus saw a disciple. Where others saw crowds of harassing people, Jesus saw people being harassed. Whoa, wait a minute. Where where others saw crowds of harassing people, Jesus saw people being harassed. Where others saw sinners, Jesus saw people in need of mercy. How did Jesus see what others didn't? He was mindful. He was open-minded. He was aware. Love 
is the result of taking a mindful, eye open, wide journey. And it, it, it's, it's making yourself aware. A person who is mindful is not detached or oblivious. They see what is not readily per perceptible, right? A mindful person is watchful. As the dictionary makes it clear, to be attentive or mindful means to express affectionate interest through close observation and gallant gestures. Gallant gestures. I love that. It's speaking of this courage. If you are to be mindful, you need to be brave. You need to be willing to be interrupted. What keeps us from being mindful? Agenda. Agenda. When our agenda is focused on other things. When our agenda is focused on what really doesn't matter. Now, if you want to be the most productive that you can be, to be the most productive that you can be in this life, that means that you ignore everything around you. But if you are going to be awake, if you are going to be mindful, if you are going to be aware, if you are going to be that kind of love, you need to be willing to be interrupted. Interrupted. Earlier this week, you know, um, there was stuff going on. I was trying again to figure out what I was preaching about, just moving around, just trying to put details together. Someone called and, and, and needed help. Just like that. Kelly and I were there, just available, interrupted. Yesterday, after the whole um, huge, amazing event happened, we, we, we had this huge, amazing event. Um, kids are passed out on the couch. Other kids are swimming. And, and um, I get a you know, message, private message on Facebook, and they're like, hey, um, can, do you have anything that you know, can help us take care of our family? And so we put some things together for them, and then they stopped, and we, I don't know, Kelly, we were out there for, what, like 40 minutes talking to them. I mean, I even got a couple mosquito bites as a result. <laughs> I know, right? We're so, like, first world concerned. Um, but seriously, like, you know, and, and after that conversation was over, I just looked at Kelly and I'm like, awesome. I got some stuff to go and write down because that beautifully displayed what God has been telling me to preach about this weekend. And so what keeps us from being mindful? Our agenda. Truth is... To be efficient means that you ignore everything. Listen to Martin Luther King Jr.'s reflection when talking about the Good Samaritan. He says this. I remember when Mrs. King and I were in, first in Jerusalem, we rented a car and drove from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And as soon as we got on the road, I said to my wife, I can see why Jesus used this as a setting for his parable. It's winding, meandering road. It's really conducive for ambushing. In the days of Jesus, it came to be known as the bloody pass. And you know, it's possible that the priest and the Levite looked over that man on the ground and wondered if the robbers were still around. And so the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the Good Samaritan came by and reversed the question. If I don't stop to help this man, what will happen to him? Ooh, that's good. If I don't stop, if I don't stop to help this man, what will happen to him? That is a question. That is a critical question. That is a vital question. Instead of looking at the circumstance, the situation, the scenario, and asking ourselves, what will happen to me if I stop and get involved? I need to ask myself, what will happen to them if I don't stop, if I don't wait, if I don't pause? Love does. Love does. I've got like <clears throat> ten quick, quick asks, okay, as the worship team is getting, getting up there, just to kind of make yourself more aware. How mindful are you? For each statement, put the number that best describes you. I, you know, and I, I was going to give you paper, but that's not really a smart idea right now just because of the virus and everything like that. And I know that you're not going to have enough time to write it down. You do have permission to take out your cell phone and take pictures if you want to. In fact, you know, as I always say, you know, like, um, you can Facebook and whatever social media, the good stuff, okay? I'm totally okay with that. Anyway, here are some 10 valuable things to say to wonder 
if you are really engaged, I am aware of thoughts I'm having when my mood changes. I ask God for wisdom to recognize needs, thoughts, and feelings in others. I'm intentional about sincerely being my best self with others, recognizing and acknowledging what others are thinking and feeling comes easy to me. I'm very aware when someone else is feeling embarrassed or emotionally wounded. Number six, I manage my emotions very well. Nope, not this guy. <laughs> Still working on it. <laughs> I set aside my own immediate plans and goals to help someone with their personal agenda. I listen for and I'm attuned to God's promptings for me in, my relation, in relationships to others. I'm mindful of God's presence with me. I hear his whispers. I'm good at relaxing my own busy agenda in order to tune into someone else's. Where are you at? Where are you at? What's going on? What place are you in? How are you invested? I'm telling you guys right now, there are people outside of this building that are in desperate need to meet the Savior of the world. And they've yet to meet him. And what we were doing yesterday, putting boxes in vehicles and looking at people in the eyes because they couldn't see our smiles, was investing an opportunity to show them the love of Christ. my church that's my church and I am so privileged and thankful to be a part of it
Come on, guys. You can clap a little bit louder, Matt. Three questions. Are you detached? What is your agenda? And what do you need to do to become, or what do you need to become awake to? What is it? Are you detached? Have you removed yourself? Have you separated yourself from what's going on around you? What's your agenda? And what do you need to become awake to? What do you need to become awake to? I believe wholeheartedly that the truth that was presented to you today is going to be revolutionary. And my prayer and hope is that your lives begin to reflect the story of the Good Samaritan, even if you have to wear a mask to do it. I pray, Jesus, right now for truth. I pray, Jesus, right now for a mighty touch. I pray right now, Jesus, that we would experience the true saving grace that you brought us and that we would begin to manifest that love in our lives because love does. May our eyes be open. May we be attuned to the things that are happening around us. Wake us up, Lord. Shake us. Break us so that we can respond and people could be eternally changed because of your love, Jesus. It's in your glorious name we pray. Amen. 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 All right.